Hello, Bruins, and welcome to our first time homebuyers panel uh, presented by the UCLA Alumni Los Angeles Westside Network. Um, my name is Howard Chang. I'm your host today. I serve as our network's social chair, and I'm also a realtor with the Serene team here in Los Angeles. Um, today, I have some fantastic panelists with me. Uh, they're all fellow Bruin alumni. We'll be discussing everything you need to know about home buying, lending, why property is important to build wealth, as well as the investor and home flipping side of it all. Um, we'll have about 45 minutes of content and then we'll leave some time at the end for a, a Q&A. Um, please feel free to utilize the Q&A feature at the bottom of the window to ask your questions and we will try to answer as many as we can during the Q&A portion. So uh, without further ado, let's get started with introductions to our panelists. Um, first, I would like to introduce a great friend and a mentor in the business of mine, uh, Mr. Kyle Draper, the, our realtor for today. Hey everybody, like Howard said, my name is Kyle Draper and I've been selling residential real estate since uh, 2013. I run the Serene team. Um, we hang our license at Ambiance Realty, and we are a four-person team, and uh, we just love helping people buy and sell real estate. And we also specialize with first-time home buyers, so we're really excited that um, that's the focus of this conversation. And uh, yeah, we're just really excited to get into it with you guys. Awesome. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, next up, we have our lender, Roland Macias. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Roland Macias. Class of 89, probably before some of you guys were born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I've been lending since 1991. So I've been, been at it for a while. I bought a lot of properties. I've helped a lot of people. I do a lot of different programs. And uh, I'm here to share my, my knowledge to, with you guys. Thank you, Roland. Next up, we have our investment advisor, Mr. Brian Miranda. Brian is also a fellow board member on the Westside Bruins. Right. Hey guys. Uh, yeah. So in my spare time, I guess I get to be the programs director and run all the events for our, our West Side Network. And my job's pretty light these days, given you know where we are at the moment. Um, outside of that, I was class of 2008. Started my career in you know financial planning and investment advice. Also back in 2008, work here and was one of the managing founders of Gerber Kawasaki Wealth and Investment Management. You know, while we're on topic of, you know, home buying, one of the common goals that people have out there is getting ownership, getting their life started, you know, buying houses, selling houses and, and managing around it. So uh, look forward to the conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. And last but not least, we have our real estate investor, Sunny Singh. Hey, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Sunny Singh here. Um, you know, I don't know which class. I graduated in because I've got multiple degrees from UCLA. I think my final degree was a PhD uh, back in 2012. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here um, just to give a little bit of a different viewpoint on how you could buy property for investment and wealth creation purposes. Great, thank you, Sonny. Okay, well, let's you know, let's dive right into this and get started. Um, my first question is for Kyle. Kyle, you've been in the real estate business for quite a few years now, and you've experienced and seen a lot of success stories with your first time buyers. Can you share a general sense of, you know, why home owning a home is important? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's really all about just getting in the game. And if you are able to do so, and of course, we'll talk more about, you know, the you know, the requirements to be able to do so, but it absolutely is just a no brainer to get in the game to stop paying your landlord's um, mortgage on their appreciating asset and put that cost of living that you're going to need no matter what towards your own uh, asset that's going to appreciate. And, you know, I have, I have one pair of clients who um, they got their starter home Let's see, this was, a, this was a few years ago. They got their starter home. It was about you know, $525,000 in North Pasadena. They put hardly any money down, only like a 3.5% down payment. And they were able to, in only like two and a half years, cash out on that 
and then be in a position to purchase their quote unquote dream home because the property appreciated so much. And these people, their jobs didn't change. Um, they have very just modest income in general, but they were able to leverage the appreciation and it, it was just such a win for them. And they're, you know, in their thirties and in their quote unquote dream home now. And it, it just, it's so awesome. And when you think about real estate as an investment platform, it's so special because they only paid three and a half percent down for that property. The bank was really the party that purchased the home when you really think about it that way. However, did the bank take all of the appreciation or like 96.5% of my clients did three and a half percent down? No, my clients were the ones that took all that appreciation and the bank just made their money on the super, super low interest rate. So it's just an incredible thing for people, you know, a lot of people get it wrong that you need all this money saved up. You really don't. We'll get more into that a little bit later, but I just couldn't encourage people anymore that if you're in a position to do so, just get in now because it'll, it'll benefit you so much in the future. That's awesome, Kyle. Great story. And you mentioned that their first home wasn't their dream home. And so I guess, can you, you know, sometimes when people are shopping for homes, they think they, their first home should be their dream home. And it seems like sometimes that's not, you know, that's not the case. And, and getting into the step of home ownership seems to be like the important key. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, again, we all need to have a roof over our head. So there's a cost of living either way. And, you know, we, we meet with clients all the time where, you know, they say, well, I think I'm a few years out because I need all this money saved up for this awesome home. And, again, it's just like, well, but you could afford this smaller home right now. Why not get in that now and then cash out on all that appreciation that in my client's example, that cash out was like the equivalent of, a, of an entire annual salary for them. And so that's how you kind of level up and, and graduate into the bigger, better homes. And especially, I know this is, you know, something for first time buyers. I think it's important that like people don't have in their head that it's got to be the perfect neighborhood and you know the perfect home where their kids are gonna you know be raised in and graduate high school from. Most people keep their first home for about five years or so, three three five years. The seven years is a number thrown around as well. But you know that's important to be thinking about because, like schools for example, do you need to be in the perfect school system when you don't even have kids yet? No, like just get your home that is going to start building wealth for you and your family. And that's not going to be your forever home, most likely as a first time home buyer. I would say just get in. Great point. Okay. My next question is for Brian. Brian, what are some wealth building and financial advantages that you see to owning a home? Well, I mean, you know, off the bat, for one, you're not really paying somebody else's mortgage anymore. That's normally the main reason people like ownership is because you get to pay down you know, into your own asset, build equity in a home. Uh, I do come from the standpoint that buying a home is probably the biggest purchase anybody's going to make in their life. So you want to go in as prepared as possible. And, you know, I, I have a lot of clients who are in this space of trying to, you know, save up towards that first home. And a lot of them try and get to, you know, 20% and some of these bigger, you know, loftier goals. And given that we're in, West LA, there's a little bit more money here to sometimes achieve some of that. But overall, I think it's really about having a plan, figuring out what's important to you, building your assets in terms of the real estate that you buy to get into a home as soon as you're able to do it responsibly, putting into your 401k, putting into your IRAs, putting into the other investments, and just having something balanced that in case any one area isn't going so hot, you have plenty of other areas that are going to make sure that you and your family are going to be financially secure going forward. Totally. And Brian, there are also some, you know, tax savings associated with owning a home, correct? Slightly less today than there were a few years ago, but that's kind of a different issue, but absolutely. Uh, your mortgage interest up to a certain point is going to be deductible to you. Uh, for certain people, if they uh, are paying your property taxes, et cetera, some of that may be deductible to you. So there are certain tax perks that are definitely going to help out. Um, I'm not a CPA. We deal with CPAs for more of the, those critical questions, but absolutely, there's definitely tax perks uh, all over the place there, whether it's your own home 
or it's uh, an investment property or a vacation property or whatever it may be. Gotcha. Okay, um, Roland, I have a question for you. Having your finances squared away or working towards the right direction is probably one of the first and most important steps towards attaining a home. What are some of the most important things a lender will consider when qualifying a person for a loan? Well, there's three things I look at. It's the first thing is the credit. It's the credit, then it's the income, then it's the assets. So if you have a million dollars and you make a million dollars a month a, or whatever, if you had bad credit, no one's going to finance you. So that's the first thing you got to look at. So what's your credit score? So find out to prepare for your mortgage, you know? So um, then income, income's going to tell me whether you qualify for a $400,000 house or a million dollar house. Then the assets will let me know how much down payment you have. So I, I, the acronym I use is CIA and those in that order is what you need to look at. So um, to prepare to buy a house, look at those three things. And credit is probably the, the one you have to look at the hardest because income, if you buy a rental unit, you know, you're going to have additional income with the second unit. Assets, you can use down payment assistance programs. Now we're talking about first time buyers today. So there's about nine different programs for down payment assistance. So, um, and the income limits are, are, are pretty high. Like in Orange County, I think it's like 180,000 is considered a first time buyer and you can take advantage of down payment assistance. And in LA County, I think it's 142,000. So they're pretty good income limits that you can still take advantage uh, of, of uh, the down payment assistance programs, even with that type of income. So, um, you know, just the first step is you know, talk to your realtor, talk to a lender to see what you're gonna qualify for. And what I do with clients is I meet with them, I figure out where they're at, and if they're not ready now, I give them a plan so that they can be ready in a few months or six months or sometimes a year if their credit's messed up and they got to clean it up. So, so again, those three things are, are the key elements to, to home ownership. Cool. That is, that's helpful. Um, for some context, what is, you know, you, you were talking about credit. What's credit, you know, what's a score, a credit score that you can't pretty much approve a loan for? Well, with this COVID madness, I mean, it's changed. There's some temporary guidelines that have been put in. But prior to this, even with a 530 FICO score with 10% down, I, I can get you into a house, which is ridiculous, but that's true. So, um, but right now the minimum is 620, but we'll get out of it. It'll come back, you know, where we can do the lower FICO scores. But, you know, if you're going to go conventional, conventional is very sensitive to your credit score. So I, I, I want you to have a score of at least 680, 700, so you get the best rate. You can go down to 620, but the rate's gonna be higher. With FHA, right now, 620 is the minimum. It used to be 580 with 3.5% down, but again, COVID's kind of messed things up a little bit. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, right now, 620 is the, the mark. Gotcha. Good old COVID, huh? Yep. Um, how, well, how much, how much money do people need to purchase a home? Like how much down payment would someone need? So if you're using down payment assistance, I mean, you can get in with 6,000 bucks, you know, $6,000. And you just change the rules before they give you the three and a half percent and 3% for closing costs. This is Cal Hafa. That's how they, that program worked. But now the maximum, unless you're a firefighter or work for a school district, it's three and a half percent or 10,000 max. So it just depends on what you do for a living. And, uh, you know, we run the numbers, but it, that's if you need assistance. If you don't need assistance, you got your own money. Um, sometimes actually I tell people, go ahead and use the Cal Hafa because with Cal Hafa, it's, it's a California something housing something, you know, it's the acronym Cal, uh, Cal Hafa. You can use, instead of using the money for down payment or for closing costs, you can do it, use it to get a low rate. So right now, I think the Cal Hafa rate is like two and three quarters or something like that. So even though you have the money, the, you can use the down payment assistance program the, and use that money to buy down your rate. And then you just come in with your own money. So it's, a, it's an interesting way to use that program uh, to just get the best rate possible. Gotcha. So. Cool. Um, all right. Sonny, I got a question for you coming from the investor standpoint. So some individuals' first property purchases not actually for a place they intend to live in themselves, 
but a property that's purely used as a rental property or you know, for some sort of income generating purpose, like let's say flipping a home, why would someone choose to go that direction? And what are some of the biggest factors to consider when going that route? Well, so, so two major reasons. So I'll answer the first part there. Um, people should definitely invest in real estate, whether they want to live there or not, because appreciation, especially in Southern California, uh, like Brian had alluded to, and Kyle as well, that, you know, wealth creation is, is the basis for getting into your dream home. So if you can only afford a $500,000 home now and you don't want to move in, you don't want to live there, uh, you know, you could probably buy that home and then flip it, sell it, or have rental income coming in because, as you know, with COVID and with everything else, the bond market has crashed. Many of the alternative investments have become very volatile. So the public stock market, the bond market, cryptocurrencies, all of these investments have become volatile. But, you know, as a realtor, you know, some of the most encouraging real estate data just came out yesterday, Right. And so the real estate market has remained stable, especially in the Los Angeles region. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that if anyone had to put their money into one asset class, it would be real estate in Los Angeles. There's tremendous value here. And so if you, if you can even get into a smaller property, uh, do it. You, if you can live there, that's even better. It'll qualify you for better loan programs. But if you can't, still make sure that you get your feet wet. The biggest risks to doing something like that you know, have a mentor. There are tremendous risks to renting right now because you can't evict tenants if you get bad tenants in. There are moratoriums in place. Um, you can't collect rent if someone doesn't want to pay you because the court systems are closed. And if you're flipping a house, you know, uh, working with a contractor, there are all sorts of liability issues. So yeah, definitely get with someone who, who knows what they're doing but don't shy away from it. Uh, real estate's definitely an investment class where you can make money. Awesome, that's super helpful. Uh, Sonny, what, so when you're purchasing a you know, pure investment property, how much capital does someone need to, to do that? Uh, you know, in Los Angeles, it's higher. Uh, most l lenders won't lend anything, uh, you know, under 20% down payment if it's an investment property. And you can re reduce that, you know, if you buy a duplex and you live in one of the units or if you buy a fourplex and live in one of the units, uh, you can technically say it's owner occupied and you could get w w much lower down payment, but 20% typically. And for a median house price of around six hundred, six hundred fifty thousand dollars $650,000, that means you need about a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars $150,000 to get started, which is a significant amount of money. But if you are willing to occupy one of the units, then uh, you could get away with much less. You don't you just you don't have to live there for five years. You can buy it as owner occupied, stay there for six months, and then move out. They just want yep. you to establish that you been you're, you lived in it. When you don't ever live in it, that's when they can come back and say, "Hey, you said you're going to live in it." So you know, like uh, Kyle said, you know, people are, want the best school district and the best of this, but they don't even have kids. It just doesn't make sense, right? I think you got to look at the value, like. Uh, Sunny and I buy stuff, and we're looking at what's what's on the upswing, and what we can what what can we buy that we know has got some future value, and we've you know and, and the programs available. I mean, I, when new houses come flipped all fixed up, and, and they want a premium for them, and first time buyers are looking at those houses, it's like you know that's I'd stay away from that. If you're adventurous, we we have programs like renovation loans. I wrote this booklet here talking about renovation loans. Um, and it just, it's a great program. So you can come in with three and a half percent and we'll give you a hundred thousand dollars to do, to fix up the house. There's a, there's a formula we use and stuff, but you can buy a dilapidated beat up old house and just get the down payment. We'll lend you the money. It's a renovation loan to fix up the property. So, um, don't, don't shy away from those properties. Uh, and everyone knows what a renovation looks like, you know, because you have all these TV shows, you know, you buy a thrashed house and you put some money and in, sweat equity into it and you have a beautiful house. So if you're adventurous enough to do that, I mean, you can make a lot of money that way, you know, so yep. don't you. think you need to have that $200,000 because we will we'll lend it to you. That's helpful. 
Yeah. All right. I, I, um, I think I want to shift gears to talking about the actual home buying process. Um, so when you start shopping for a home and you know, you start writing offers, you're going to hear the word escrow being thrown around a lot. Um, you know, this home's now under escrow. It just, this home just fell out of escrow. Um, Kyle, I was hoping maybe you can shed some light. What, what is escrow? And can you share maybe like a quick overview of, you know, what the escrow process looks like? Absolutely. So escrow is the process um, from the offer getting accepted. You know, you submit your offer, seller accepts it. There's a, an entire process between that and then the deal closing, title transfers over to you as the new owner, and you know you get your keys. Um, so the the main points of the escrow are for you as the buyer to do your due diligence on the property. So you're going to review the seller disclosures where they have to tell you any issues they know about the property. Um, you're also going to run your property inspections. So you'll probably get a general inspector out there to look at just about everything. Um, we personally also recommend for the first round to do termite inspection and also sewer line inspection. And you're going to be kind of compiling a list of issues with the home. And everything is negotiable, of course, but you will most likely um, renegotiate with the seller on if there are certain repairs that you need them to do for you to feel confident moving forward with the deal. Um, or maybe they just throw you some money towards, towards uh, credit repairs. Um, the other big, big, big component of the escrow is your loan. And, and it going from you being just pre-approved, meaning that the lender has uh, looked at your finances and feels confident that they can issue the loan. Um, but once the offer is accepted, then your loan actually goes through a much a higher level of scrutiny um, it's called the underwriting process. And then as we progress through the escrow, we eventually get to a point where the lender says, all right, like we're good to actually issue you the loan. And once that happens, um, then you sign your loan docs. And, uh, you know, a few days after that, the deal actually closes and you are the official uh, homeowner. Nice. Thank you, Kyle. Um... Okay, well, Roland, question for you. What are some things that buyers should expect from, you know, the lending side during, during the escrow? You know, I, I tell people when I pre-qualify them, I said, you know, this, this is a snapshot of your financial position. Don't change things. If you got your grandma giving you a hundred grand, don't just pop it in your bank. I, I need to know. And sometimes they, they, they say, well, you know, um, I'm, well, I had a pilot. He's from El Salvador. And he, every time he flew into the country, he'd bring $10,000 cash because he had a, some kind of farm or something. And I look at his account, he's got like $130,000 and every month, all of a sudden, I said, dude, you can't do that. You can't just bring cash. So you got you to gotta remember that when a lender pre-qualifies you, that's the snapshot he's taking. So if anything changes, don't just dump money into your account. Don't change jobs because, again, we're, we're – Again, I go back to the CIA thing, credit. Don't go out and buy furniture for a house you don't have yet because people have done that before. And now their ra debt ratios are, are exceeding the guidelines. Now they can't qualify for the house. Income, don't change jobs. I have guys going from, commission, uh, from salary jobs to commission jobs because they're, they're promised they're going to make more right in the middle of the transaction. Well, guess what? Commission jobs, you need 24 months of it before I can average it to get an income. So you don't have any income, according to the bank. So you're, you know, 20, I can average 24 months and assets, you know, again, if money's coming in, let me know because there's a way to do it. I got a paper trail, all that stuff. So that all those things are super important. So when you talk to your lender, it's almost like you got to confess everything to them because I need to structure everything to make sure it, it's, it needs guidelines. So lenders don't like variance and things changing during an escrow. We, we like slow and steady, right? Well, we just need to know what's happening. You awesome. know? And again, those three things, credit, income, and assets. Cool. All right. Um, Sonny, anything that differs for you from you know, what Kyle and Roland shared for when you are in escrow on a property? Do you like bring a contractor with you to estimate costs for renovations? Um, do you already have a good idea what those might look like? Um, yeah, we how, how do things look for you? 
Yeah, we definitely put in terms uh, into our contract, which are not conventional. You know, we'll, we'll put in a lot more inspection contingencies, a lot more due diligence, and uh, definitely we bring either a contractor or I go and estimate costs myself. And so a little bit more legwork uh, during the escrow process, going to the city, making sure everything's legal and above board, uh, making sure that we don't run into any snags when doing the construction work. Um, so th that's basically what differs. Um, sometimes, and if you're lending for an investor, then it, it's a totally different type of loan also. Um, sometimes the hard money lenders will want to walk the property as well, and they might have their own contingencies in place. Okay, and, and you, you're talking about contingencies. I think Kyle may have mentioned this, but um, can you explain what contingencies are to, you know, these first time home buyer? Sure, um, sure. so, uh, yeah, I, I can do that. So, so when, when you sign a contract to purchase a piece of property, uh, that contract has a number of conditions under it that need to be satisfied before the property can be sold or escrow can close. Uh, those conditions are called contingencies. One very common contingency is an appraisal contingency. For example, if you go and get a loan from a bank, they're gonna send an appraiser out to see if the value of the asset is within the ballpark of what you're paying for it, and they're gonna loan on that value. So if their appraisal doesn't come in at the value you want, um, you can cancel that contract and the purchase is non null and void. You get your deposit money back, the escrow doesn't close. So basically contingencies are conditions to closing the transaction successfully in the contract. Or we can call them get out of jail free cards, right? Yeah, sometimes they're not free, but yes, sir. <laughs> Close. And, and let, let Close. me add as well with that. Um, so right when your offer is accepted, you as the buyer, you have three business days after acceptance to submit your deposit to the escrow company. And in general, in Los Angeles, that's going to be 3% of the purchase price. And so escrow will hold on to that money to make sure that you as the buyer play by the rules of the contract which just means that if you do want out of the deal and you expect to get that 3% deposit back, you need to use one of your contingencies properly. So like Sunny just said, you know, appraisal, that's a big one. The inspection contingency is another big one. So if you inspect and you find all these problems and you can't renegotiate to your satisfaction with the seller, that's okay. You know, you can just use your inspection contingency, recover your deposit and walk away and you know, you're on to the next one. And then the, the other biggest contingency is your loan contingency. Um, so like Roland was saying, don't go out in the middle of the escrow and buy a boat or something like that that completely changes your finances. But if you do something like that, that, that slips up um, and the lender is no longer able to issue you the loan, so long as you still have your loan contingency, you're not gonna lose that deposit. Cool. I have one question about contingencies while we're on the uh, topic. Sure. Given how competitive the market is, especially here in Los Angeles or Southern California, it does seem like in order for you to win out a bid and get your offer accepted, that a lot of people are throwing out some of the contingencies that would otherwise be like a you know, red, you know, red flag, don't mess with this. Have you seen that that's been kind of a trend or are there ways to actually get offers accepted at appropriate prices without having to give up the farm, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it, it really just depends on how competitive um, that particular property is. I mean, some properties, like Howard and I had one recently where there were uh, 24 offers submitted on it, and it just was absolutely insane. That's not the norm. Um, you know, and then there's others that have been sitting on the market a little bit longer that you can actually negotiate with the seller, uh, and you don't have to have those crazy terms. But, you know, sellers, they want to accept an offer. Obviously, price is really important but the likelihood of that deal going through is super important to them as well, because if the escrow falls apart and they have to remarket the property, it statistically will go under contract again at a lower price. So it's really important that um, the terms reflect that, that the buyer is in a position to be very confident with closing. So um, aggressively shortening the inspection period, because the contract you know, defaults at 17 days to inspect, but for the first time home buyer um, residential market, you know, to be competitive, you're probably gonna have to shorten that window to maybe like just a week. 
which is which is plenty of time. You just have to make sure that your real estate agent is very on it. Like um, right when the offer is accepted, the property inspections are getting scheduled. Um, and then you know, obviously, if if you're in a position where maybe your down payment is so high that if it doesn't appraise, that's not going to affect your ability to get the loan. If you're a buyer in that position, then absolutely. If you waive your appraisal contingency, that will make your offer more attractive. So every every deal is kind of unique. And um, it's just a matter of how competitive is it? And are we in a position where you can confidently, with still covering your bases and not being reckless, you know, either shorten time frames or remove some contingencies? Um, but again, it's just a matter of how competitive that particular property is. Brian, from a you know financial planner standpoint, well, first of all, you and I just closed a transaction on uh, some clients of ours recently. So, hooray! Good job. Any general I heard advice? Great things. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Any general advice you'd tell to buyers, you know, to be aware of during a transaction? I mean, one of the biggest things that people always ask me when they are, you know, they set their goal as home ownership, right? They just want to make sure that the mortgage is appropriate for their income. They want to make sure that they're not going to go basically house broke is kind of the, the term where you just liquidate all your assets in order to make this happen. So you want to leave yourself plenty of cushion. At the same time, more than not, down payments are coming from a mixture of just regular bank savings accounts, as well as a liquidation of, uh, liquidation of mutual funds, ETFs, uh, company stock, whatever it may be. And some of that takes a, you know, some time in order to make sure that the sell-off plan is gonna be appropriate to make sure the funds have time to get out to escrow, right? To, Cause we don't want any delays. And I've had a few clients of mine who went through basically the whole process and rather than telling me, hey, we got you know, our offer accepted so then I could start the process of making sure everything goes smooth. They bring me in when they say, oh, our offers was accepted two months ago and we need our money this Friday. And I'm like, you're really, not really going about this, you know, the right way. So just have some order in it all. And the more order you have, the more processing you have, the easier it's going to be to make what otherwise is a terrible process sometimes go super smooth. So better to get ahead of it, be prepared and go yeah, going it. with the plan. I mean, that's exactly it. Just make sure that you're, everything's lined up because you don't want any surprises during that period of time. Cause the last thing you want to do is have something happen where you weren't prepared for it. And it caused you to back out of a deal, which is terrible. So, and that's not fun for anybody. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Um, well, I want to talk next, you know, a little bit about neighborhoods. Uh, Kyle, what, you know, as a real estate um, realtor that we're featuring today, what are some trending and emerging neighborhoods around LA? Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, that's part of why LA is so cool is just because there's so many different Kind of pockets of it that it, it there's just so many different worlds really and it i don't know i i love it and it makes the job really exciting and interesting um we do a lot of business up in uh, northeast los angeles so these are neighborhoods like highland park glassell park mount washington um eagle rock and those neighborhoods are kind of like where echo park and silver lake were maybe 10 or 15 years ago where they're absolutely emerging um, from a commercial standpoint. They do have the like, you know, cute little shops and cafes and the fun bars and all that stuff. And I think property values over there are really only going to continue to increase um, in large part because the Frank Geary LA River revitalization project. Um, I don't know if people on this call have heard much about it, but they're, they're going to make the LA River a whole lot nicer and it'll actually be like a destination and the headquarters for that is going to be right where um, this this big park uh, in Glassell Park um, Frog Town is just on the other side of the river but you're going to be able to like rent kayaks there and you know cruise down the river a bit it's it's just really going to do a whole lot for northeast LA when you know there's already so much exciting emerging stuff happening there so um, we do a lot of business there. We feel really good about appreciation in that part of town. Um, and then let's see some other neighborhoods. Uh, everywhere around USC is is definitely um, on the up. The, the university, they put a lot of money 
into like the commercial stretch leading up to downtown because you know downtown has completely transformed our city now we have a proper nucleus and and really an anchor and everywhere around it is benefiting from that um so you know jefferson park lamert park we're seeing i mean we have seen the developers putting the money in the residential side for a while and we're just now starting to see like the cute cafes and all that popping up um commercially so uh, we really like uh, property values. We expect them to rise um, over there. Boyle Heights, just with the proximity to downtown, um, I certainly think that if you purchase in Boyle Heights that you will be sitting on a whole lot more money than you purchased it for in a few years. Um, West Adams is also very much emerging. Um, Adams Boulevard at like Hauser and Redondo, that, that little stretch right there um, is very dense in terms of these like cute shops and cafes and whatnot. So I think if, if you can get a place in West Adams um, that's maybe walking distance to that little pocket I just said, I think that's a killer, killer buy. Um, so it, it's exciting. There's just, you know, a lot happening in LA. And, you know, having said that, if you purchase a property like in Santa Monica, it's still going to appreciate in an appreciating market. We're just saying that some of these neighborhoods I just said, the ceiling's a bit higher. Um, but, you know, real estate in Los Angeles, like, like we've been talking about on this panel, is, is a pretty good bet no matter how you, how you shake it. So, <laughs> yeah. And for you guys that aren't aware, West Adams is basically between downtown and, you know, Culver City, just under the 10, right in the middle there. Mm -hmm. um, how about an area like Inglewood and maybe Sunny and Roland, you guys can shed a little light. I know you guys... I think you guys just closed on a, on a property over there. Yeah, it's currently in escrow. Gotcha. But uh, yeah, I mean, Inglewood with the stadium, everyone knows that, you know, the values have popped up and stuff. The one uh, Sonny and I worked on is uh, North Inglewood, right next to Westchester. So it was, you know, it's a great little area. It's La Tijera Village. And, uh, you know, it's uh, just... I think we did a great job. We, we did an ADU, an auxiliary dwelling unit. So we turned the garage into a one bedroom unit. So whoever, actually the person buying it, Sonny, isn't he buying it for his mother and then the caretaker is going to live yeah. in the ADU, right? Yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, there are pockets, like every, uh, you know, adding to what Roland and Kyle said, every area within Los Angeles has its own micro market going. So, you know, even though LA as a whole and you see all th this data coming out, oh, the median prices are going up, they're going down. Uh, you know, this is the jobless rate, this is the employment rate. Uh, LA is a massive city, it's a sprawling city. And these statistics at a macro level don't always apply to markets at a micro level. For example, Inglewood as a whole, you know, has a median price, but then there's this pocket called La Tierra Village where we do projects, which is full of affluent, wealthy, people in Inglewood. And, and, and uh, as soon as we put this property on the market, we had multiple offers within three days of listing it, it was an escrow. And this was in the middle of the COVID pandemic, right? Uh, uh, a month ago or so. So, you know, all these statistics are great, but if you know your micro market and you know what's going on there, um, you know, that, that's, that's how the money's made. Inglewood's a great market. Westchester's great. Most of Southwest Los Angeles is doing really well. Um, you know, it's close enough to the west side, uh, close enough to Culver City, to Playa Vista, but still at a price point where the ceiling of appreciation is pretty high and you can, you can make some money there. Gotcha. Um, Brian, I think we talked briefly about this, you know, just the other day. A lot of people are priced out of homes in most areas in LA. So what, what would you say are some alternative options that maybe you'd recommend? I mean, each scenario is going to be slightly different. Um, I know a handful of people who just do not want to deal with a commute. So let's say they work and live in Santa Monica, but they're priced out to the point where they can only buy in Van Nuys, for example. You know, maybe that's financially the right thing to do, but you're also giving up, you know, at least an hour each way, you know, depending on, on traffic and all that, right? So a lot of people, you know, like to sacrifice to be able to have that home for their family and they're willing to deal with it, right? A lot of people, and I might get some flack for this considering I'm on this panel, right? Uh, just keep renting until it becomes affordable. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do 
on the planning side to boost the amount of assets that you have to make what would otherwise be a, a fantasy into something that's actually something that you can buy and without having to deal with an hour plus commute. Um, at the same time, I have other clients of mine who are fine renting wherever they may be. Let's say they're priced out of that neighborhood. They'll stay renting there and they'll find a property to purchase. Maybe it's out of state. Maybe it's somewhere else in California that's just not you know, commutable. And that's a way that they're able to start building some type of equity in the meantime until they're able to come around and buy their own home. So there's, there's a few different options that people have. Nothing is, there's no right or wrong answers. It's what's, you know, personal preference. Um, the more you start getting into properties that aren't yours, that you're not actually living in, deal with a property management company. So there's certain things you gotta be, you know, aware of and have to deal with there. But overall, there's a lot of different things, a lot of options for people out there. And given like, you know, obviously the current climate of COVID, you know, I've, I've been reading a lot of articles just that, people are becoming more and more comfortable with living further and further away from, let's say like a metropolitan area like Los Angeles. Um, you know, it just seems like, well, who knows what the direction of, you know, where this pandemic is going to go, but you know, that's, that's also an option that a lot of people are considering nowadays. Um, and that kind of leads me, I, I wanted to save part of this panel for talking about COVID. Of course, what's a discussion, nowadays without talking about COVID. So um, Kyle, how has the housing market been impacted by COVID, you know, from a procedural and a economic standpoint? Sure. Well, I guess let's just talk about the market a little bit first. Um, you know, it's funny because talking with clients, a lot of them, they expect it to just be a walk in the park right now as buyers. Um, but that's just not the case, unfortunately. It's, it's a phenomenal time to buy. But because it's so phenomenal, it is competitive still. Um, right when COVID hit, like that first month of shelter in place, everybody was spooked, basically. Um, a lot of buyers that, that we were talking to were like, look, we, we were hitting pause, whether it be a physical fear or an economic fear, the majority of people did not want to move forward with purchasing real estate in that first month. And, you know, on our team, Howard actually represented a buyer that was actually willing to transact and Howard got him like a hundred thousand dollars off of what the most recent comp in the building had sold for. But that window of opportunity was so limited to just that initial kind of shock that the entire you know, world felt about, Oh my God, like we've never seen this before. This is so weird. And then I think as shelter in place just continued to go on, and I think people started realizing, okay, this is going to be this weird situation that we're in probably until there's a vaccine. This vaccine isn't going to come out for quite some time. Once people had that realization, they started to re-enter the market. And um, the demand is, is very high right now from the buying side because interest rates are so incredibly low right now. And the amount of inventory that's out there, meaning the amount of sellers that are listing their houses for sale, it is still pretty small. So, you know, the demand is exceeding the supply, which is why we're still seeing multiple offers on attractive, well-priced homes. Again, that doesn't mean that, that you should wait because we, or at least me, I, I don't believe that we're in the you know, future that we're going to see for LA residential, especially the first time home buyer market. Um, I don't think we're going to see like prices tanking or anything like that. For, for LA first time home buyer residential. So I would get in now while the interest rates are, are just so amazing um, because I just think it's a phenomenal opportunity. In terms of procedurally how things are different right now, um, there are no open houses. So you really do need to link up with a, a real estate agent early in the process. Um, Cause before you could kind of just, you know, pop on Zillow, see what properties are open and just not really, you know, develop relationships that early on in the process. Now you do need to develop that relationship because everything is shown via private appointments. Um, there's a COVID waiver that you have to sign for showings that basically says you're not symptomatic and you can't sue anybody if you do get sick. Um, so yeah, procedurally it's a little bit different, but um, it is just a phenomenal time to be, uh, you know, finding property right now. Yeah. 
yeah, LA, LA real estate seems to be on the, on the ups actually, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're seeing the total number of transactions is down, but prices are not going down. And so that's important for you, know, you to have realistic expectations that entering this market, it's not about, oh, let's just throw these offers out you know, way under, under list price because that's just not the market that we're in, unfortunately. Cool. Um, Roland, what are some positive and negative effects that COVID has had on the lending in industry and as well as for borrowers? I know Kyle mentioned you know, interest rates are really, really good right now. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I mean, COVID changed guidelines that, you know, like I said, before I could get you into a house with a 530 credit score, not 620 minimum. Um, uh, positives, I, I, I don't know. It didn't improve anything with, on the lending side. Um, but like Kyle said in the beginning of all this, when everyone was frozen, I think that was the time to jump on things because people thought things were going to happen. So if you had a positive mindset, you could make offers on things without having 10 other people making offers on properties. So that there's a little window there where, you know, if you're adventurous, you would just went in and just made your offers, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, the positives for COVID, well, for me, I, I do a lot of energy efficient mortgages, which most lenders don't, where I can take a house, like my son just bought a house built in 1893. So we did all the energy work. It's a folk Victorian old thing. That thing performed, we did a blower door test on it, and that thing performed like a house built in, in 2010. We did the installation of the walls underneath, the, we spray foamed underneath the, the, the basement, just everything. So that's my specialty. I do energy efficient lending and renovation. And, uh, you know, in, in this market, when you, when you have 20 people making an offer on a house that's already fixed up, well, find something that isn't fixed up. and, and like, I think I was looking at some pictures of some of the properties that, I mean, I know we don't have a ton of time, but this is, uh, let me see if I can show you guys this. This is the, the, the Inglewood property. Remember that, Sonny? <laughs> Most people are walking by that thing, you know, running from it, right? <laughs> well, if someone would have had a renovation loan, they could have, you know, ended up with a nice almost million dollar house, you know, with a wow. little bit of work, well, a lot of work, but, uh, and that's what renovation loans do. You know, you, you go to the properties that no one wants and we lend you the money to fix them up. So as a first time buyer, you really want to squeeze some equity out of, out of something, find something like that. We have a property in the Highland Park we're working on. That thing was just destroyed. But we're, everything's all brand new, new electrical, new plumbing and stuff. And a lot of home buyers could have had a chance to buy that, but they looked at it and thought, I don't have the money to fix it up. But renovation loans are, are there to, to help people do that. And you gotta, you're able to compete with investors. And I've gotten deals for clients where the homeowner, they don't like the fact that investors are going into their neighborhoods and, and, and buying these properties because they want families to move in. So we write offers saying, look, it's a family that's going to live there. They're getting a renovation loan to buy the property. And, you know, you got to use some psychology here. You know, some of these home sellers they want families. They want people that are going to live in the house to live in it. So again, renovation loans are a great way to do that. And, you know, with the COVID-19, everyone's worried about air quality and stuff. An energy efficient mortgage with all the work that's done improves the indoor air quality. It's the huge uh, issue. So. Very interesting. Um, Brian, question for you. From a financial planning viewpoint, what are some necessary precautions to take while considering to you know, purchase a home during a time like COVID? I mean, I've kind of brought it up already. You know, you just want to be prepared with your financing, uh, make sure you have all your money handy, but more so than that, on a, on a broader perspective, you want to make sure that your job is secure, right? The last thing you want to have happen is you, you know, COVID is causing people to, you know, get layoffs, get furloughed, incomes are decreasing. So you want to just make sure that there's nothing really that's going to deviate your plan in case that, you know, were to come up. So just leave yourself more cushion than you otherwise would is probably the best advice I can give regarding that. Cool. I'll say one thing with a renovation loan, you can, you can finance up to six months of payments into the loan. So you don't have a payment for six months. So that's is there a, a limit on the renovation loan? Yeah. What is one what thing is, I go to bring up while we're, cause I don't know who specifically is on this webinar. Hi, everybody out there. 
but you got to remember to differentiate between the flipper, investor, the contractor, renovation loans, all that, versus those of you who are your first time home buyers, two jobs, and you don't have the time necessarily to go after big projects. So I know a lot of the, the conversation has kind of blurred the two. So just make sure you kind of know what you're in for from the get go. And that's, that's true. It's not a TV show. It's not, it doesn't take, you know, it's work. It's, it's another job work. almost. But so, you, yeah. that's where the SWAC equity comes in, but it's, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I can tell you it's a profession. It's definitely a profession. I can tell you that. <laughs> and you get a, you do a good job at it, Sonny. Um, okay. Well, well, I, what's that? No, no, go ahead. Okay. I think I want to uh, now open it up to the Q and A. We're almost at the top of the hour here. Um, let me see. Okay, we got a couple questions here. So <clears throat> let's see. First one says there is there is an assumption that you can build wealth because the market is always rising, but many people fear buying property at a high, particularly in LA, where property values are so inflated. Is it still prudent to buy property if you're not sure if you will still be in LA one to three years from now, assuming down payment credit is not an issue for at least, let's say, a condo? I could jump on that one. Sure. So um, yes, real estate values do not like exclusively go up. You're gonna have your market cycles, the ebbs and flows, of course, if you zoom out wide enough though on the appreciation chart, it, it will go up from a long-term standpoint. So, but you're exactly right. If you don't know if you're gonna be in LA um, for the next couple years, um, one consideration is that you can always, well, you'd wanna make sure that if you buy a condo that there aren't rental restrictions or something, but theoretically you should be able to rent your property out if you're in a position where you are leaving Los Angeles. And if the, um, if home values are down, you don't want to sell when it's down. That's, that's the thing here is like, you just want to be in a position where you are not forced to sell your home in a down market. And, you know, some, even with some clients right now who, who think like, what if the market goes down in, in a year from now? Oh my God. You know, I personally don't think that's going to happen, but if it does, you're not going to sell your home next year. Like, there are costs associated with selling your home. The seller pays both sides of, of the realtors. That's probably the biggest cost right there. So you, it's not the kind of thing where you buy a home and then you sell it the next year. It, it, flippers do that, but that's a whole different world. Like you guys as, as homeowners, um, like owner occupying homeowners, you're going to be in your home for, you know, like I was saying earlier, probably three to five years. So if Zillow tells you, you know, six months from after you purchase the home, that, that Zillow thinks your home is less than what you purchased it for, like, yes, that's going to sting a little bit, but you're not going to sell it anytime soon. And when you go to sell it, the market will, you know, again, we might have little ebbs and flows, but it, 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 you know, if we just wait another few years, the market will be up by then. So um, yeah, I would, I would again, just say like, get in, you know, get in. Cool. Thanks, Kyle. Um, here's a good question from Jacqueline. Can you talk more about the loans with low interest rates? What type of loans are these and how do you get one? There's three traditional loans. There, you got your conventional loans, which is Fannie Freddie and minimum down payment, 3%, depending on if the house is in a certain area. You got your FHA loans, which the down payment is three and a half percent. That rate is actually usually lower than a conventional loan but they have mortgage insurance on it, on your monthly payment and in the loan. So you, you end up paying more, so you gotta do the math to see if, uh, if it makes sense. Then you got your VA loans. So the lowest interest rate, if you're just looking at the interest rate, is usually an FHA loan. But uh, again, they have that, they hit you twice with mortgage insurance. So um, every case is different. You know, you can do a conventional loan with, a, get put five, 10% down, and pay mortgage insurance, or you can do a lender paid mortgage insurance. Mortgage insurance is something you pay if you don't put 20% down. But with the lender paid mortgage insurance mortgage, um, you get a slightly higher rate, so that it's basically self-insuring the loan, and you don't have mortgage insurance. And sometimes when you do the math, uh, you save yourself, even though it's a higher rate, you save yourself a couple hundred, $300 a month because you have no mortgage insurance. 
and the rates are still low right now, it's sometimes it's, it's always an option. I always check that to make sure the client understands that, yeah, your rate's going to be higher, but your monthly payment's going to be lower. And traditionally, I think Kyle even said, people stay in their houses five years or something like that. Well, traditionally, they might not sell the house, but you, you don't keep your original mortgage for more than three or four or five years. So, you know, even though it's got a high rate, you're still saving monthly. In three to five years, you're probably going to refinance to pull equity out to, you know, to do something. So um, if you're worried about monthly costs, uh, always look if it's a conventional loan at a lender paid MI uh, type loan. So save you money monthly. Cool. Roland got another lender question for you. And this is pretty, I like this question. It's from Mark. It says, do I have a chance to get a loan with no income recently laid off? Uh, but su substantial assets, though not enough to pay all cash. And I think this is, you know, very relevant, especially just given what's going on with COVID and just individuals losing jobs right now. There Who's are some some loan programs. It won't be a FHA, VA, or conventional, but they're investor loans that use bank statements. So if you have a stream of income coming into your bank statements, you know they'll they'll use that as your income. If you have have a high asset. You know, you can use depletion of assets to pay the mortgage. You know, so there, there's certain things you can't, loans, rates are high, but you can buy a property. So it's very, a specialty type type loan. Non-QM, they're called. Gotcha. And this is a, this is a good current events sort of question. So Tamara asks, in light of current political and cultural shifts we are experiencing, do you foresee first-time home buyer, first-time buyer programs for Afri African Americans emerging? That's a very interesting question. I don't think you can do that. I mean, they're they're available to everybody. Mm -hmm. They they more do specialty specialty down payment assistance programs by edge by uh, occupation, firefighters, doctors, um, uh, people that are uh, in education. That's kind of the programs that I see. Uh, hero programs were for police officers, you know, um, I don't think they do it. I don't think they can do it for ethnic, you know, reasons. Gotcha. Certain zip codes might have um, certain programs if, if like the median income for a certain yep. zip code is a little below like the city at large. But I, I agree. I don't think, um, the problem, you know, the 3% the, the down conventional, I, I used to use that program in certain areas, but they, they about last year they changed it before if they really wanted people to buy in an area, they let you use that 3% down program with unlimited income. Someone got the bright idea that they cap it at 66,000 or 67,000. Well, you can't buy anything making that much money anywhere. So they, they kind of blew that program. I don't know why they did that, but uh, cause what we're able to do is find properties just like, I did one in Paramount right next to Downey. It, it basically was Downey because you look across the street and it's Downey, and, but it was in that zip code. So this person was able to buy this great deal, but he was living you know, on the fringe of an of a area that most people don't want to live in, but he enjoyed you know, living like on the border. of. So we were able to kind of use the program to buy in those areas. Now they just said, nope, no more unlimited income on certain zip codes. It's just... Basically, you punch it in. It is a website, and it ends up being like sixty-seven thousand dollars. But again, down payment assistance programs. I think in LA County, it's one hundred and forty-something thousand. Orange County is one hundred and eighty-nine thousand. That you can still get some help. So, um, you know, it's it's worth looking into. Okay. Um, I have a question. Maybe Brian is a financial advisor. Maybe you can talk on this one. Do you have any pointers for those who want to buy a home with a single income and maybe this alludes to a question like what are some strategies or tips that you would you would give to um you know people that want to save to purchase a home yeah i mean whether it's single income or dual income it really doesn't change the ratios that we look for um based on just financial planning you want to have your total spend on principal interest taxes insurance hoa basically all those costs be at 35 percent or less of your gross income. So if you're making a hundred grand and you're single, or if you're making 200 grand and you're you know, married or with a partner or whatever it may be, that 35% doesn't change in that ratio. So you just want to just not overextend yourself 
Um, but otherwise, you're still going to be planning for a pretty sizable, you know, payment. You're going to be planning for if it's a condo, you know, maybe a single income can only get you into a condo first and then you get some equity there and then wait a few years and jump into a single family home. So there, there's a lot that goes into it, but obviously there's certain restrictions there with how much you're able to save based on the fact that only one income is coming in. So that's super important. I mean, I deal with a lot of people in that situation and you just have to run through the numbers, come up with a plan. And like that's, that's why I exist. It's to go through those and make it so that maybe it's not a reality in six months. Maybe it's a two year goal, but it doesn't mean that just because you only have one income doesn't mean you're excluded from home ownership. So just come up the plan. Can, can I add something on that too? Um, you know, for people who are entrepreneurs or, you know, just your income is, uh, is 1099. It's really important that you like long in advance, you meet with, you know, your financial advisor, somebody like Brian, you talk to your CPA as well and you all get on the same page because they're going to look at what you, what your net income is on your tax returns. So you might be in a position where it's like, Oh, this is awesome. I make all this money but then I write almost everything off in expenses and it's great. I don't pay much taxes doing that, but that strategy is going to make it a lot harder for you to qualify for your loan. So um, a lot of times we will work with clients like that and they will intentionally not write off as much knowing that they're going to have to pay a little bit more in taxes, but it means that the lender is going to be able to uh, look at their income and qualify them for a higher amount. So um, if you're, if you're not a W2 employee, you really do need to be strategic, you know, in the year or two leading up to your home purchase on that. Very good point. Cause I see that all the time. I ask them, how much do you make? And they tell me they're gross. And then I get their taxes. I mean, they wrote off everything, you know, and you know, so very great point. Good point. Kyle. Good point. All right. Well, we have just passed the top of the hour. I think might be time to close and I'd like to wrap up here. Um, I do want to say we have recorded today's panel and you will be able to watch it on the UCLA alumni YouTube page. Um, if I know there's a lot more questions. Uh, if you didn't have, if you had questions that weren't answered and want to reach out directly, you know, to one of the panelists for advice or whatever it is, I know some people were asking about um, just general home buying advice and you know, Kyle and I, our team, we have some great resources that we can send. I don't know if we can attach those um, to this, to an email or something, but uh, you can feel free to reach out to us and we'll get that to you. Um, and we'll send out, you know, the email with all of our contact information. So just be on the lookout for that. And I want to say a big thank you to all of the panelists for joining us today and just sharing all of your expertise, super helpful. Um, I want to thank all of the alumni association staff that helped make this home buying panel happen. And most importantly, um, thank you to you all for tuning in, everyone. We really appreciate you joining us and, you know, getting involved, asking the questions. I hope you all gained some new knowledge and insight today. And, um, you know, also, we, we hope you can stay connected with our Westside network. Um, I encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Uh, you can search at UCLA Westside and just stay connected and learn about our, our upcoming events. You know, we have a lot of virtual programming during this time. Um, our next event is Friday, July 17th at 8 a.m. It's a morning mixer to network with local Bruins. So we hope, hope to see you all there. And once again, thank you all and go Bruins. Go Bruins. Go Bruins. All right. See you all.